so you want to be a dungeon master, but you're not real sure on where to start. Well, luckily for you, me and Jeremiah put together a list of five things every new dungeon master should know. I'm Jeff. This is Hillbilly Hobgoblins. Let's get into it. Hey guys, these so these are going to be our top five things you need to know when you begin DMing. They're in no particular order. Uh, we just listed out five things, and we're going to let you guys know uh, what they are, why we think they're important for you to know before you DM. Uh, yeah. The first thing it seems kind of simple, but a lot of new DMs don't understand that you need all of these books. So the first thing is you need the Dungeon Master's Guide, the Player's Handbook, and the Monster Manual. Yeah, for sure. Uh, a lot of new DMs don't know that uh, the Player's Handbook has most of the rules for players. Well, it should be without saying, but it has most of the player rules in it. The Dungeon Master's Guide has like the DM rules for sure, but a huge, uh, a huge percent of the the rules that you're going to have to learn are in the Player's Handbook. Right, and you need it uh, as well for when you when your players make their party, you should read up on what classes they're wanting to play. That yeah. way you know generally at least how they work, so you know if they're using them correctly. Uh, you know, they may make them way too overpowered or may not be using them to their full potential, and you can help them out with that by knowing a little bit about what their characters can do. Yeah. And uh, if you've never DM before you will quickly learn that if a player has a question about their uh, about their uh, class or their race or anything, they're going to ask you. They're going to ask you before they ask, uh, or they're going to ask you before they Google it, and they're going to ask you before yep. they go in the book and read it. Like, right. And that's time. the way it should be. And if you have the book, you can just present them with that knowledge and maybe keep them out of Google where there's a lot of crazy homebrew that they might accidentally <laughs> pick up. Uh, <laughs> uh, also, the monster manual kind of goes without saying. If you're going to run encounters, you're going to need to know the stats of the monsters, and those are yes. all contained in the monster manual for the most part. There are other books that have different monsters, but the core set of monsters uh, is the monster manual. It has tons of monsters. You should never run out of monsters to use against your players. And uh, uh, if you're running modules, if you're running pre-written adventures, uh, one hundred percent of the time, if they're not monsters specific to that adventure, it's going to tell you to use the stat block out of the uh, monster manual every time. Right, it'll even tell you what page to go to in the monster manual. To it makes it light work for you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and the DM's guide, I mean, it is what it says. It is the guide for DMing the game. It has a lot of different rules in it. Uh, you know, it, t- it explains all the dice systems, all the advantage, disadvantage, it explains m- the majority of the rules that you will be enforcing on the players and also provides like helpful tips about what to do in certain situations that may come up in your game. A lot of times you can find the answer to those in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Yeah, it, it is uh, essential, in my opinion. If you're, if you're going to... Uh, run you know what what lost minds i think you can run it using the uh the starter uh rule set like the three Mm -hmm. three to download i think you could run that with the three rule set but i don't think you can run anything else i think all of the other modules you're going to need uh yeah all of those books to be honest a lot of the starter sets do come with starter rule sets that you can use but still just because they come with starter rule sets doesn't mean your players will do something that comes up that's not in those rule sets that you need to consult an outside source, which would be your either your player's guide or dungeon master's yeah, guide. Yeah, that, that, that's 100% true. I just mean like bare bones. The starter yes. sets, you can play with the basic rules, but nothing else. I agree. In, anything else I agree you totally. need. totally. Yeah. Uh, Num- so the second thing yeah. is session zero. Jeff, go ahead. Let us know what session zeros for are. Session, session zeros are uh, a, a big deal. There's a lot of people that say they don't want to waste a session by building characters or whatever. I'm, I'm just going to say it. Those people are wrong. Don't listen to them. Uh, se- session zero is where you as a DM get to lay down your expectations on your party and you get to ask them what they're expecting of you. Uh, you also... Uh, you can go over any house rules you might have. 
like using a like drinking the action as a bonus action to, instead of, instead of a whole action. Stuttered. Drinking a potion. <laughs> drinking a potion as a bonus action instead of a full action. Right, uh, right. Taboo subjects. There's uh not a whole lot of players out there, I would imagine, but we've ran into them that will uh do very uh weird and like gross. You can play. say it, creepy. Yeah, creepy. You can like lay out subjects that you just won't won't deal with. Uh, you can. I mean, it's a good idea, and and you can get uh, from the players too subjects that they don't want to deal with. So you don't yes. want one of your players getting triggered by another player, and then the campaign falling apart, and you just lose your party based mm-hmm. on something that could have been avoided to start with. I use a uh, in my games that I run. I use a system called Lines and Veils. Uh, mm-hmm. You, I highly encourage every DM to look that up because, in my uh, opinion, it is the most helpful way to uh, get everybody's input and get a feel for what everybody's cool with or not cool with. Mm-hmm. Also, think it's important to run your session zero well before you actually start playing your yeah. campaign. The reason being is you can, even before they make characters, you want to make characters all together, first of all. Mm-hmm. But also you can explain the setting to them, explain the world, kind of generally, without giving them uh, insight into the module, generally what's happening in that world. That way they can craft their backstories around the world you're presenting and not the other way around, which is much more difficult. Yes, in my 100%. opinion. Uh, uh, going along that, if you're going to play in a module and you want a backstory, and you want a backstory that kind of ties in, run that by your DM, and don't yeah. don't don't be a main character. Don't try to don't try to win at D and D. Don't try to make a character that knows all of the secret twist in the module. That's that's no fun for anybody. Leaning into that, if you are running a module as a dungeon master, uh, also before your session zero, it is important that you read the entire module. I know <laughs> yes. it's kind of a grind, but at least read through it one time. Take an hour or two, however, whatever speed you read at, and just read through the entire module so you know, at least have a general idea of where this campaign is mm-hmm. leading. Don't try to read it section by section as you run it because there may be clues or hints dropped in the section you're running that lead to something later. You have no idea what they link to. You just don't even understand it yourself. So when the players start inquiring about it, you don't know what to say. It's not a good look. Yep. There's always, uh, and I feel like they should add something in, in these pre-written modules that say, you know, this will be brought up in chapter 10, if you're in chapter one or whatever, just so you can like, as a DM, you can go and like, get that information ready, you know? Right. But, but yeah, read the entire module, understand how the story ends. Uh, if anything, establish a beginning, middle and end. Right. And you can even make yourself a little outline, just a couple key things that happen here and there that you can follow kind of like a, a roadmap. Yeah. Like, uh, just make some bullet points. That's what I do. I just, uh, write down key Same. NPCs and, uh, key story moments and that's it I make basically a like a flow chart of the adventure like this is the first place there and here are the NPC here's the information they gain here which leads to this place or this place or maybe one of these places that they can choose and then from there it leads here and here that way you at least know generally what's coming next yeah. as you're as you're playing and I think that runs right into our point of uh, prep time. Yeah. Uh, put all of your prep time into the story and into the encounters. Don't worry about random shopkeepers. Don't re- worry about that bartender your party meets at a tavern. Just make sure the story is there and make sure the encounters are ready. I know there's a lot of DMs out there that prep for hours and hours for a session. That's fine if that's what works for you, but it's unnecessary the majority of the time. Yep. You can probably play prep 20, 30 minutes max. Just hit what I like to call the high value targets in the model, like what actually matters to the story, which NPCs actually have the information that these PCs are looking for or can progress the story. So you want to focus on the things that can progress the story and then, you know, have like random 
tavern keeps or random even encounters that don't really matter like bandits rob them on the road but it has nothing to do with the story Mm -hmm. don't focus on those when you're prepping you can just run those on the fly because there's not anything really you need to know about them other than this is something that happens and uh pro tip keep a list of npc names because oh yeah your party is 100 percent going to run into some random random guy in a bar and just ask about their entire life story and you're going to have to make it up as you go have a cool fantasy name ready have a list ready uh i i tend to not do that i got a lot of characters named like dave and john (laughs) john smith is a very popular name (laughs) in the faerun for me yeah i mean like he said it's a 50 50 chance if you're just describing a tavern you're like oh there's a couple guys sitting over having a few drinks 50 50 whether your players are gonna say i want to go talk to these guys over here having drinks and you're like well i made those guys up so let me quickly think of a name if you have a list you can just pull from yeah. check it off the list depending, Boom, go to the next one next time depending on your group they might want to talk to everybody in the tavern i mean it's possible it's, it's, it's good to be thorough yeah which but. leads kind of uh to another point here the fourth point which is uh don't over describe situations and locations yep and um, uh, I, I you're think, not writing a book, you're playing a game, right? Yeah, I, I think that goes into this surge of people getting into D&D from podcasts, from Critical Role and uh, Dimension 20, which me and you are both huge fans of. Right. But Love it. there is a difference between D&D, uh, podcast D&D, and like really playing D&D. Uh, I agree. They're telling a story for us, but you're telling a story for your cares no one yes, else so. exactly you you're not going to have an audience even if you're streaming on twitch you're not going to have a huge audience of people just wanting to know what the story where the story's going you have it's you and like four or five other people that want to they want to fight things and they want to you know tell a cool story you don't need to spend 20 minutes describing a town you don't need agree. five minute long monologues because what ends up happening when you over describe things to an excessive point, you you lose your players' interest and they yes. quit paying attention, which means they're not hearing what you're saying anyway, and they're going to miss out on the important details of the place. So, what I like to do is like if you go in a tavern, don't describe the whole tavern. Don't describe how the the wood floors creak beneath your feet and the <laughs> candlelight blows of wind that's coming through a window that's slightly ajar the intricate in the carving on every just chair just pick a couple things be like hey the if and make stuff up that's interesting like yep. the bar in here's unique it's in the middle of the tavern and it's it's a circle circular bar uh it's a single floor tavern and there's a band playing or there's a couple bards playing some music and that's it that's all you need yep. Your players can imagine what they think it looks like, which is more fun anyway. And I would like to add, if your players ask for more detail, that's when you give it, not the other way around. Yeah. Don't don't give them too much Let detail them, without asking. Yeah, and it makes them feel like they're actually exploring something. Like if they say, hey, what's the, what do the tables look like? They're probably asking for a reason. They're not just real curious about the tables. Yeah. You know what I mean? So then you can describe the tables and maybe they'll want to do something Try to set one of them on fire if they're made of <laughs> low quality wood or something. Yes, uh, that's, but, uh, that's something I harp on with new DMs. Like I, I preach this like it's the gospel. Don't run games like you're Matt Matthew Mercer. That's just it's been said a thousand times, and I'm saying it again. Don't just don't do it. it it'll be a lot more fun if you don't. And the same goes for describing towns, cities, even uh, monsters that they're going to face. Uh, Maybe if you want to give a little ominous vibe, just be like, you hear some rustling in the trees. You don't have to describe in super detail what this rustling sounds like. People can use their imagination to yep. what they think is happening. And then right. when the monster pops out to attack, give one prominent feature. If it's an orc, yes. be like, it's a large green monster with tusks or water. Yeah, and a big protruding underjaw or under. Yeah, you don't have something. to give... He's got a scar going across his left mm-hmm. eye from years of long battle. His armor is chipped, and you don't have to do that. It's, it doesn't matter, and nobody's going to care about that, quite frankly. Yeah, two or three Your sessions. players aren't going to care. Two or three sessions later, they're not even going to remember. They're going to be like, hey. They're going to try to kill that thing as yeah. fast as possible. They don't care about his life yeah. story. 100%, 100%. 
Speaking of monsters, Jeff, what's the last one? The last one? Uh, you know, just, just a, a, a pretty big one. Uh, the DM, as, as the DM, you're not trying to kill the party. It's not... It's true. It's not party versus the DM. It's a collaboration. That's what D&D's always been. And I understand it can feel like that. You get a little mm-hmm. competitive. It's like you're playing the monsters. You're like, so I need to try to win this combat. And I mean, monsters are trying to survive. So you yeah. want to play the monsters how they would actually play. You don't want to pull punches on that. You know you know what I mean? Yeah. But you're not the, definitely trying to kill your players. The monsters are trying to kill your players. And that's where you right. need to figure, figure that out. The monsters are trying to kill your players. You're not. You are... Uh, you want to give them danger. You want to give them a sense of life or death. But if you wanted to just, you don't want to completely just overpower them and roll them. It's just, you don't want right. to give them unwinnable fights. You want every fight to be winnable, even if it's difficult. You can have deadly encounters. Uh, you can have easy encounters, but you, no matter what, you want them all to feel a little dangerous, but not actually be insurmountable. Yes. Hundred percent. You don't. Uh, you want them to feel like they accomplished something when they finish it. Yeah. But you don't want them to feel like it was unfair. Yes, hundred percent. And uh, to kind of add to that, not every encounter has to be da- uh, deadly. You don't have to try to kill. No. The players don't have to die or almost die every time they fight. You can just give them a a low level easy encounter just to try out some new stuff they got on their last level up. If you want, like. Right. You can have them robbed by bandits that are far too low level, and that might be a pretty good comedy scene that you could have where they're fighting these bandits, and then these bandits quickly realize they're outmatched and try to run away and or plead for their lives or whatever. The fa- the classic Skyrim scene where you just killed like eighteen dragons, and this bandit's like, "You shouldn't yeah. have came this way. You're sure you're, you're trespassing on my land." <laughs> you know, you can have stuff like that too. Yeah. Now, the important combat, you don't. They don't have to be deadly, but if it's important combat to the story, you want it to seem like it is deadly. Yeah. You want it to seem like, oh, this is going to be very difficult. You don't want like, to, even if it's not difficult, yeah. you want it to appear that way. You want the players to think that if they got, if, if they killed the, uh, whatever enemy they're fighting, if they completed that encounter uh, quickly or seem like easy you want seem like it was too easy you want them to feel like they just got lucky you don't want them to think that wasn't hard right i yeah. think man we really had to use tactics and things to get out of that yeah and just come in and just roll it punching it to death and uh uh kind of controversial opinion on this as a dm sometimes you have to like you know, balance stuff on the fly and take away hit points from monsters or add hit points to monsters. Or it's true. I, I, I never, especially using modules. Yep. I never fudge my rolls. I never like roll a nat twenty and say that it didn't hit because, you know, it's the dice. You got to be kind to the dice, or they won't be kind to you. But, right. but you know, take taking uh, AC down or adding hit points. Maybe even not using a creature's uh, full list of features or not using a monster to, to its whole effectiveness if they're not, uh, uh, if they're having too hard of a time with, that's completely acceptable. And, uh, I mean, you'll know very quickly if you have a, you've been building up this uh, encounter with this big not the big bad guy, let's say one of his henchmen, but you've been building it up. He's been taunting the players, and finally they're fighting when he has 50 hit points, and the first attack hits him for 35. You're going to be like, well, you know, I've been building this up. I probably should add him 100 or so. Maybe here. I should so give him 100 more. You don't want to instantly be over after you've been building it up. Yep. So it's fine to do that. Yeah, yeah. It's fine to take away hit points, maybe reduce damage like you said. Yeah, Maybe even you could role play it out. Like if you if they're fighting a dragon, you know that dragon's breath is going to one shot them. Maybe when you're describing the dragon, one of the key features that we talked about earlier, you describe is that it has a big scar on its throat or something, and maybe it can't use the dragon's breath, or they infer that it can't use it. Yes. Because of this, it's injured, but it will heal later. Maybe it comes back later when they're stronger. Yeah, that's that's a that's that's good actually. I like that. Did you just make that up? 
I did. Yeah. I did. See, he's such a good DM. So you got to make, you know, just make stuff up. Yep. That's 90, in, in my opinion, like 90% it's of the It's the bonus DMs. number six. Just make <laughs> stuff up, yeah. man, you know? Just go with it. Just make shit up all day. I know a lot of the information we've been using is related to modules, but it also is uh, related to homebrew, too. When you're coming up with the challenge rating of your creatures, make them, you know, you don't want to roll your guys. Yeah. And, uh, don't make it too hard. Bonus, bonus number seven. Uh, if you're just starting out, run a module, please. Please just yeah, run. Just do it. Just run a module. Get the feel for how to DM before you write a year and a half long campaign. It, it, uh, Use one of the starter sets specifically. Yes. yes. You, Lost Minds <laughs> is really good. Lost Minds is my favorite starter set. It's it's such it's just so well written. It's a good module. It's just robust. Run it. Yes. Just I have heard that they are going to expand on that later on uh with a higher level that comes off of Lost Minds. So it would be a good fun. one to run. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, those are our main tips. Uh you got anything else? Top five with bonus six and seven. That's how much we love you guys. We give bonuses out when we weren't planning on it, so you know, the least you could do for us is hit that like and subscribe. Hit that notification bell so you know when we go live with new content. Yes. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Instagram, TikTok, MySpace, uh, Farmers, Only, Farmers Only, Christian yeah. Mingle. That's, That's a good, good one. Follow us basically anywhere there's social media. We're there somewhere. You just got to look for us. He'll be the Hobgoblins. <laughs> He'll Hobbs on Twitter and uh, TikTok. Correct. And, Correct. Uh, is this the part where we try to come up with a cool sign off? Yeah, we're still coming up with them, yeah, so we're uh, testing some out on you. Go ahead. Let's hear uh, it. Uh, uh, natty lights and hot dice. Man, that's kind of, I'm going to lie. That's one I was going to go with, too. So <laughs> let me, let me, uh, yeehaw and dungeon crawl. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> All right, guys. Till next time. <laughs> Bye. Hey guys, you'll have to excuse me, I'm a little under the weather, but I wanted to make sure you check out our awesome merch store. It's going to be linked in the description down below. You get some stuff like this cool hat with this amazing embroidery. It comes in five different colorways. Also, uh, have your favorite beverage in our new Hibbly Hop Goblins coffee mug. It's ambidextrous. You can use it with both hands. It has logos on both sides, different ones. So yeah, make sure you check some of our merch. we got plenty of stuff. And if you have any ideas for new stuff, let us know.